Is kayak fishing dangerous is one of the number one questions typed into Google around the topic of kayak fishing. I've been reading way too many articles out there of men, women, and children getting injured or killed by one of the mistakes or a combination of them that I'm about to share with you. Mistake number one, not respecting the water. And what I mean by this, especially in moving water, rivers and creeks, when they're high, can be extremely dangerous. People simply underestimate the power of moving water. Just two feet of moving water can move most vehicles. Like we're talking SUVs. Now how guys and girls get in trouble is they head down to the river or creek and it is a lot higher than they expected it to be. But maybe they've been looking forward to this trip so long, they decide to go out anyways. And that's where they end up getting themselves in trouble. Low head dams are notorious for taking lives on rivers. You don't know what undercuts and strainers and sweepers are. Just do a little bit of research before you head out onto moving water. And also the surf. People underestimate the power of the surf. I just had Larry Melton Jr. on and he shared about how he took his old town autopilot out on the water down in Destin and totally completely flipped it in the surf. Like battery, motor, everything to the bottom of the ocean. Now here's the thing, flipping your kayak can happen to the best of us, which brings me to number two, which is capsize. Now here's the thing, if you go kayak fishing, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when before you accidentally flip your kayak over. Just had a buddy text me not too long ago. He was standing in his kayak, he was fishing, he came up on this log and he was kind of moving himself around the log using the log, kind of leaning into it and kind of pushing his boat around. Well that very large branch broke off around 40 pounds landed on him he fell into the water he flipped his kayak and all of his gear was now in seven and a half feet of water and so he was okay he was wearing his personal flotation device which is great but he learned a valuable lesson in tethering so let's just say he has all his stuff tethered because he had to take a couple days to dive in that seven and a half feet of water to get all of his <laughs> lost gear since you're going to flip your kayak since you're going to fall in the water sometime right if you're really into the sport accidents are going to happen know how to do deep water re-entry i just had a gentleman write me on youtube yesterday he's like hey i had my kayak i was in my pool i was practicing deep water re-entry he said i'm sure glad i did because there were some nuances to it specific to his kayak now he knows how to get in and out of his kayak safely if you were to fall in now if you don't have a pool not a problem just plan on it at the end of a day for you if you're getting ready to do the last cast uh, have a towel have a change of clothes in your car and just hop out and then learn how to get back inside there's a lot of videos online of how to do this but there's actually a couple techniques of how you can get back into your fishing kayak so when it comes to these mistakes it's usually not one mistake by itself that will get you into trouble it's the compounding of many of these mistakes that really get yourself in trouble and a lot of times will take your life so moving on to mistake number three is underestimating the water temperature now here in ohio right now if I fall in this water, one, it's only like three or four feet deep, but two, the water temperature is like in between 70 and 80 right now. So not a big deal. However, if I were to fall off my kayak in May, when the water temps are in the 40s and high 30s, well, that becomes a problem. So let me run some scenarios by you. If you were to fall into water that's 32 and a half degrees to 40 degrees, you have about 15 to 30 minutes before you like go unconscious and about 30 to 90 minutes of survival. So if you fall into water between 40 and 50 degrees, you have between 30 and 90 minutes before you're completely exhausted or you go unconscious and about one to three hours of survival. In water between 50 and 60 degrees, you have between one and three hours before you are completely exhausted or you go unconscious between one and six hours of survival. So keep in mind that wet clothes can make you lose heat at a hundred times more than dry clothes. So as someone who has hiked the Appalachian Trail through hiked it back in 2008, you figure out very quickly what are really great clothes to wear uh, when you're out hiking, uh, when you're gonna be in all kinds of weather and what is actually really poor clothes to wear. So a couple things here, air temp can throw you false signals. You know, if you're out in a unseasonably warm day in May, it's like 75 degrees it could make you think that the water temperature is like it would be during the summer. So keep that in mind. You're also gonna to wanna to dress to swim. So if you're out in cold water, you're gonna to wanna to wear clothes that when wet are actually gonna hold heat. Wool is gonna be your best bet here. Also your synthetics. The worst thing you're gonna wear on a cold water day is your jeans, your flannel, and cotton. So also your PFD is gonna be a huge help here. Let's say you fall out of the water. You, all you can do is throw your arms over the side of the kayak or you get a phone call out and you go unconscious before someone comes. Well, this is gonna give you extra time for someone to come rescue you. Another mistake that a lot of kayak anglers make, especially on their first few times out, is they go fishing solo. I just got done fishing with my dad a couple months ago, it was May, and he took an unplanned swim. And I was around the corner and he yelled out my name and I thought he caught a fish. I was like, sweet, and I got over there just soaking wet. And he was starting to get cold really fast. And I started to think of myself, if I wasn't there, 
it would be a good 25 to 30 minutes before he got back to the dock and he would have been soaking wet. Now, luckily I had a dry jacket and I had a tow rope and I just towed him back to the dock. That could have been a really risky situation if he was out there by himself. So if it's your first couple times out, do yourself a favor, take a buddy who's been doing it for a while. He's gonna be able to help you show the ropes a little bit. All right, the next mistake a lot of people make is an incomplete weather check. And so uh, I was just doing this this morning, looking at the weather. And the first thing everyone looks for is, is it going to rain? And then after they see if it was going to rain or not, if it is going to rain, how much is it going to rain? And is there going to be lightning? And that's usually the end of their check. So the problem with this is that they stop there and they don't check the wind. And with kayak fishing, wind is a huge factor. So if the wind gets over 10 miles an hour, if you're a paddle powered kayaker, it's going to be difficult for you. If it starts getting more than that, it can actually get a little bit more risky than it needs to be. It might be impossible to paddle back to your loadout. Uh, the wind might kick up, might start getting some white caps and some waves that you're not used to. So you could potentially capsize. You could lose all your gear to the bottom of the lake. It's not tethered down. I was actually out with a buddy and it was a pretty gnarly day. And uh, he told me later, it's like, hey, you took an amateur out on an expert day. I was like, all right, I'll give you that. He got his anchor caught and he could not get it free whatsoever. And he couldn't really get himself back to it either because it was so windy. So in that scenario, I had to break out my safety night and I, I cut his rope and then he was free. All right, the sixth mistake a lot of people make is underestimating animals and there's all kinds of them out there, especially in the water. I know up here we have a ton of beavers and they get freaking huge and they can get very territorial um, especially because i love fishing beaver dams there's a lot of big bass up under all those sticks so what they usually do they give you a warning they usually tail slap and they'll do that a couple times and then the, like, the next stage for them is they'll start circling you and that's really <laughs> the hint that you really need to get out of there uh, how you de-escalate with a beaver is just leave the area but if you don't you keep fishing it then you can have some issues on your hands now we're talking freak animal incidents here but sharks people are terrified by those and i just watched a video of this guy fishing off the coast of hawaii and he had a tiger shark come up and like take a chomp out of his boat and I, sometimes i fish with like my leg over the side i'd be like a peg leg right now so i had to keep down on that a lot of times sharks will come up and and come close to your boat because a lot of times you're dragging fish. All right, next we have snakes. Up here in Northeast Ohio, we have water moccasins. They're not super aggressive, so I'm not really worried about them. A lot of times when I see them, they're just up on the banks, kind of basking in the sun. So for me, I just gotta watch out for them uh, whenever I'm loading and unloading, especially when I'm doing that not at a boat ramp. And most snakes will breed in the spring and the summer, and so this is gonna be the time that they're most territorial, so keep that in mind. And for those of you down south, you got gators, which can be terrifying. A lot of people are like, I'm never getting the fishing kayak because of the gators. Uh, but just keep in mind, if you do get out there, they mate in the spring and the big ones can get really territorial during that time. All right, the seventh mistake a lot of kayak anglers make is underestimating open water. I see a lot of guys who are fishing like three, four miles offshore, which is fine, go get some. But if you're unprepared for that type of fishing, you get yourself in trouble. And so don't rely on a cell phone if you're going that far offshore. Make sure you have a VHF radio, a very high frequency radio. This is going to give you the ability to call the Coast Guard. And if you can't get a hold of the Coast Guard, other vessels in the area. I mean, it'd be easy to catch a big fish, get turned around. If you can't see land, get yourself it lost and get yourself in trouble. And also if you're fishing, you know, salt water, um, depending on where you're fishing, you can get swept out. I read this crazy story. Uh, this guy was fishing in Hawaii on a kayak and he got swept out. And 24 hours later, the Coast Guard picked him up 80 miles offshore. Crazy. So if you're gonna fish offshore like that, go to town. Just make sure you have the proper safety uh, measures in place. So you have all the gear that you need to get a hold of someone if something goes bad. Another way a lot of anglers get themselves in trouble is having an unsecured paddle. And so just ask yourself the question, for the type of fishing you're doing, if you were to lose your paddle, how much danger would you be in? If it's a lot of danger, either carry a backup paddle in your bow or in your boat somewhere or have a paddle leash on if that is right for you. Not a big deal for me in Ohio because my primary source of power is my pedal drive and I have a lot of tools on board to fix that and I also have a backup which is my paddle. So for me, not a big deal. I don't secure it. I don't carry an extra either, but depending on the type of fishing you do, you might want to consider it. All right, the eighth mistake a lot of people get themselves into is they they don't plan for equipment failure. They have a trolling motor, and let's say the battery goes out and they get themselves in trouble. They flip their kayak and it fries the wires and their motor lo no longer works. Or on their propel drive or, or pedal drive, the shear pin snaps or the propeller breaks and they have no other way to get back to load out. So it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So just think through, if you were to have equipment failure, uh, what would be your backups and what would kind of be your plan of action to call for help 
or get back to loadout. Or the ninth mistake a lot of people make, especially first starting out, is overestimating their ability. Uh, maybe they get super excited to get out there and start kayak fishing. They have the whole day planned. They go five hours down the side of this lake only to turn around and realize they don't have the energy to get back. Or maybe they're out on the ocean or in the bay. And so I guess the Coast Guard gets calls all the time about individuals that need rescue simply because they don't have the energy to get back. So do yourself a favor, ease into your kayak fishing journey, start out on a small pond or a small lake and get used to it and slowly figure out what your ability is so you don't overestimate it and get yourself in trouble. All right, the tenth mistake a lot of people get themselves into is underestimating the sun and they don't bring enough food, they don't bring enough water. And so everyone's a little bit different when it comes to sensitivity to the sun, but it, the sun is a different beast out here on the water, especially the first couple times out. Bring more water than you think you are going to drink. You might need it. And I get it. You're out there and it's a hot bite day. And if you're like me, you just kind of forget to drink and you forget to eat because the bass are actually slamming it. So just make sure you have the proper nutrition. Uh, you don't want to end up getting heat exhaustion. So heat exhaustion is your body's response for an excessive loss of water and salt. What will start to happen to your body is start to kind of feel sick, you start to get dizzy, you start to get muscle cramps. These are all things that make your kayak fishing experience more risky than it needs to be. So carry extra water, carry extra food, make sure you're safe out there. And once again, it's usually not one of these mistakes that ends up taking a life or getting someone injured. It's usually a combination of many of these mistakes together that takes a life. Usually the common denominator of all of the mistakes and all the articles that I read is because they're simply not wearing their personal flotation device. I just read an article, which was heartbreaking, of a dad and a son who went out kayak fishing and did not come back. And they found them and they were not wearing their PFD. I know the reasons why people don't wear them. They feel like they're really great swimmers, but you can't swim when you're unconscious and you don't need a PFD when you can swim. You need it when you can't. So do yourself a favor, stay safe out there. Find a nice PFD, make sure it's sized correctly. If you have a PFD on, it's not sized correctly, it's almost worthless. So find a nice PFD that feels comfortable. If you love kayak fishing, there's a lot of great options. The one you're looking at right here is the NRS Raku. Now, what I just shared with you was a lot of knowledge, but I also believe that gear saves lives. And so I have a video on this, life-saving gear that should be on your kayak. Check it out, right there.